Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April, April 23rd, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about the three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, During the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our analysis of how Alaska legislators are dodging personal responsibility for a proportionate share of the cost of government spending they are approving. Second, A question that is arising during the discussion of all tax credit bonds. Why are at least some Alaska House Republicans supporting a proposal that will make Alaska's future spending problems even worse? And third, a look at what's going on with oil prices and is the recent rise sustainable? And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Yep. Every week we get down into it to talk about these things with our expert on uh, oil, gas, and uh, sustainable budgets. It is Brad Keithley uh, from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find them on Facebook and more. Good morning, Brad. How are you this morning? Michael, I'm doing great. I was actually fascinated by the calorie count on the various pizza combinations you were coming up with. So I I almost... I, I almost didn't dial in. On yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how do you force a business to spend a hundred thousand dollars in signage, and then how are you going to say you need to come up with a computer system that people can plug their ingredients in and tell them how many calories? And if you don't, it's a hundred thousand dollar fine for inadvertent violations. I mean, at what point are we protecting us from nothing? You know. Yeah, well, we're going to be protecting us from pizza because nobody's going to be selling pizza <laughs> if, they ha- if they have that sort of liability. I see what the plan is now. I see it now. It's an evil plot to overthrow pizza. Uh, let's talk <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, regulations in the state of Alaska, shall we? Uh, you, have, okay. you have been a busy man. You have been a very busy man. You have been uh, burning the midnight oil and running. I mean, your house must look like spreadsheet heaven because you have got uh, some real hard numbers that have been coming up lately. Let's start things off uh, by talking about uh, some of the things that uh, that you've analyzed now as far as with the cuts to the PFD and everything else. Who's benefiting from all these, uh, you know, from all this backdoor chatter and all these things that are going on? Who's really benefiting? Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Michael, this is an analysis uh, that should have been done, um, frankly, earlier in, in, in last year's session. It's an analysis of, of the uh, uh, income position of various legislators and how that might influence their votes. It's an analysis that you see virtually every day in things like the Washington Post and the New York Times right. when they're analyzing legislators' reactions to, um, uh, to various you know, tax policies or various economic policies. Uh, but it's one that's never been done uh, in Alaska. And, and I started getting curious. Uh, the, more, the more legislators have pressed on the PFD uh, as, as, the, as the fiscal option, indeed the only fiscal option, uh, uh, to raise new re- revenues that we need to, you know, match their excessive spending. Uh, the the more they pressed on that, the more I got curious about how PFDs were impacting them compared to what other alternative, how other alternatives would impact them, and whether that was, you know, whether you could see some sort of trend or some sort of influence. And I, right. I got to tell you, I, I was surprised uh, uh, myself by the outcome, how how stark uh, it is. And when you look at it and you look at the number of uh, people in the legislature and what their average income is, um, it starts to get pretty 
clear that the people who are leading us are really more out of touch with the people than what I considered when I didn't when I hadn't seen the actual breakdown to begin with. Yeah, it's so so let's start with the with the with what ICER tells us about cutting the PFD, right? Right. Cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. It is by far the costliest to Alaska families, and it takes the most money out of the Alaska private sector of any of the alternatives. It has a bigger adverse impact on the economy, on families, and on taking money out of the private sector of any other of any of the alternatives. So, if you were if you were judging policy from the standpoint of economic impact on the state of Alaska, cutting the PFD would be the very last thing that you'd want to do because it has the largest adverse impact. But when you analyze it uh, in the context of legislators, it, 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 something emerges that's just, that's just amazing. Let, let, let's talk for a second about the impact, just to set the stage, let's talk for a second about the impact of cutting the PFD on a middle-income family, an Alaska middle-income family of four. Um, uh, according to the data that's been delivered to the, to the legislature, a middle-income family in Alaska has an income of between $40,000 and $73,000 per year. Midpoint of that is 50, around $56,000 uh, per year. That's uh, uh, So an, a, a middle-income family of four, uh, just to, to pick the midpoint of the of the of what that bracket's earning is fifty six thousand dollars a year. Um, so a PFD cut of eleven hundred dollars a year, uh, eleven hundred dollars on the PFD, which is what they came up with this year, is an impact of forty four hundred dollars on this family of four. That's seven point eight percent, roughly eight um, percent of their income that's being taken away by PFD cuts. Right. But when you but when you look at legislators. Um, uh, and I broke it down. That they, people who are interested in this analysis can find it on the Alaska for Sustainable, Sustainable Budgets Facebook page. We wrote an article on it in Medium, and we've got the article posted there. Um, when you when you look at legislators, um, the set in the Senate, the average income of midpoint income of legislators in the Senate is three hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars. <laughs> a cut. A cut of now that's compared to the average income of the middle income Alaskan of fifty four fifty six thousand dollars. So it's three hundred fifty nine thousand uh, dollars average income in the Senate, um, and so the PFD cut is only one point three four percent of their income. They're only losing one point three four percent. You pick a you pick a senator. I've picked Peter Machecki because. Last year, Macheki gave a, a speech on the Senate floor about how voting for PFD cuts was, you know, a profile in courage. He was a profile in courage. Well, it, 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 it looks like he was trying to push. He was a profile in somebody else's courage, right? Because he was pushing somebody else out there to take the economic, to take the bullet. Yeah, uh, Macheki's uh, the midpoint of uh, Macheki's income, and these are. These are incomes that they self-report. The legislators self-report uh, to the APOC uh, every year, and I took the most recent from March of this year. The midpoint of Macheki's um, uh, income uh, for for 2017 was four hundred and eighty-eight thousand dollars. Right now, he has a family. He has a family of five, so that's a fifty-five hundred dollar PFD in, uh, impact. But that's 1.13% of his income. Now, keep in mind, for a middle-income Alaska family, it's 8%. Right. <laughs> for Macheki, Macheki, it's 1% well, uh, of his income. I, all i got to say is, man, I'm so glad he was courageous in that vote to be able to take that cut. Uh, but, I mean, he's not the upper. You know what really shocked me was to look at the upper, you know, upper and upper middle income that may, I mean, I made less than every member of the legislature and then some. Some of them made eight times more than I did. And I mean, I'm just my mind is blown when you look at where these folks are coming from. No wonder they're completely out of touch with where the you know, with where the average Alaskan is. They can't even identify with middle class Alaska. Yeah. And and so and so you look at you look at the you look at their choices, right? Now remember, ICER says Cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, is by far the costliest to Alaska families, and takes the most money out of the, out of the Alaska private sector. Bad stuff, right? So you would want to look to alternatives like a flat tax 
to, to raise money, things that didn't have those bad impacts. But when you look at, at the Senate, again, uh, a flat tax to raise the same money that the Senate's raising through PFD cuts, the flat tax on all Alaskans, this is all Alaskans, would be about 2.75%. That would be much better for middle-income Alaskans, and in fact, much better for every income class except the top 20%, 80% of, of, of Alaskans. It would be much better to have that uh, to have that flat tax than to have um, uh, PFD cuts. I mean, again, keep in mind the PFD cuts for a middle income family is r roughly 8%. A flat tax would be 2.75% of their income. So they would be better off with the flat tax. Every senator, every senator is better off with a PFD cut. They, they pay less out of their pocket uh, as a result of a PFD cut than a flat tax. None of them, none of them would, would, would benefit from a flat tax. They all pay less uh, when they do PFD cuts because of, because of their because of their income level right so no no wonder no wonder I mean again this is stuff that if if we were if we were dealing with Congress this is stuff that the Washington Post and the and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg would have long since done and long since analyzed and I just I I finally did it myself because I couldn't find it anyplace else but no wonder you've got these legislators pushing for PFD cuts because it barely touches them. Right. Not with the, what it's doing to the average Alaskan is, is, you know, a huge amount of their income, but it barely touches them. But if you move to a flat tax, which would be a much better approach from the standpoint of the overall economy, from the standpoint of Alaska families, and from the standpoint of money being taken out of the private sector of Alaska, if you move to a flat tax, they would all pay more. So, no, they don't want to do a flat tax. Right. Um, it's just, I, this analysis is just amazing to me. Well, what's, here's what's amazing to me. After, first of all, after reading it, you're right. Yes, it is amazing. I appreciate you doing it. Uh, second of all, what's amazing to me is, is that... No, no other reporter in Alaska has done this analysis. Like you said, Washpo, The Times, somebody would have done this at national level issues or on larger state issues, but nobody is doing it. Nobody in the state of Alaska is looking deeper on a lot of these issues. Like I said before, they're taking the press release from whatever majority is giving it to them, and they're kind of expanding on it a little bit, and they're putting it off as news. Uh, Craig Medrid had an article the other day that was talking about journalism equals Facebook equals journalism. There's, I mean, the, the, where is the deeper questions, fact checking, and more in journalism? It seems to be going away. The only place you're getting this kind of information is from folks like you and other groups that are out there doing independent analysis because they're just, it seems like they're just carrying the water on this. It is. I mean, I, it, it, to some degree, we've got We've got sort of a bare bones staff uh, uh, looking at these issues and the journalistic staff looking at these issues in the state of Alaska, but but this is basic stuff. This this is basic journalism, basic analysis, one hundred and one. Right? What's the economic interest of of the legislators, and are is the is the legislation tilting in favor of those economic interests? Now, quick. Let me quickly say that I'm I'm not alleging. That these guys are doing it, these guys and women are doing it um, because the two the two most wealthy uh, people in the Senate, the two the two highest incomes in the, in the Senate, are both women. Um, I'm not alleging that they're doing it uh, to 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 tilt the table in their favor. Some may be, but I'm not alleging that they're doing it to tilt the table in their favor. Favor, but they're just not sensitive to the issue. I mean, at these income levels, they're just not they're not thinking about the impact on on middle income Alaska families or lower middle income Alaska families. Some some may be, I mean, Bill Wilikowski has voted against PFD cuts, notwithstanding the fact that he'd be better off, well, it, he'd be better off with, uh, uh, with PFD cuts economically. Some may be trying to concentrate on the impact on lower income Alaskans, middle income and lower income Alaskans. But by and large, you can see the insensitivity of these issues. Right. One more time, <laughs> Well, it, it won't be one more time because I'll do it several more times. But, <laughs> but cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, is by far the costliest to Alaska families, and takes the most money out of the Alaska private sector of any of the options. Yeah, now, any of the 
Let me say this, Brad. Any of the alternatives. I, I, let me say this, because I don't want us to seem like you know, we're bashing people for making money. Quite honestly, by God, I would love to be up there making, you know, McKinnon, you know, $935,000 a year at the median mark. I'd love to be doing that. I would That would be fantastic for me. But I think you have a valid point when you say somebody that's making $100,000 a month has a hard time you know, hearkening back to somebody who's making $50,000 a year and identifying with that situation, you know, especially if it's a family of four, they just, they can't, you know, it does not compute. And so I think that's the point here. We're not bashing them for making money. We're saying they are out of touch and disconnected from the effect of a mere thousand dollars on a family of four when they're only making $50,000 a year. And that's part of the problem is that, it, it again, it adds to the whole bubble effect of being in Juno, of being out of touch, and then add to the effect that most of these people are making multiples of what the average middle-income Alaskan family are making. It really adds to that problem. It does. I mean, you, we, we talked about we talked about trying to develop, or I, I tried to develop an analogy. The, the cost... The cost of of uh, of the PFD cut is about the cost of a Starbucks a day. I mean, that's about the impact, uh, economic impact. About you know, if you divide it by 365 days, it's about the cost of a Starbucks. Well, a Starbucks to to this um, uh, to this income group that we've got in the Senate is yeah okay it's a starbucks right you know i i i sell them they would tell themselves i seldom finish a starbucks ad yeah you know, i'm just you know what's what's a starbucks a day but you go to a middle income family and and a starbucks a day is pretty damn important it's pretty damn i mean that takes you add it up over a month you add it up you add it up over a week add it up over a month add it up over a quarter add it up over a year that's a that's a that's a significant amount of money it's eleven hundred dollars and and that's you know you, if you've got four in the family that's forty four hundred dollars you're t- you're taking out of your pocket people aren't doing that but to this income group uh, when you look at the Senate um, and to, and to a large extent when you look at the House uh, to this income group it's just it's it's pocket change so yeah okay so we we cut the PFD so what even though it has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy is by far the costliest to Alaska families and takes the most money out of the Alaska private sector. Yeah, so what? It's it's only you know it's less than Starbucks. It's the cost of a Starbucks a day, uh, but but that's just that's just total insensitivity. ICER didn't come up with these conclusions about largest adverse impact on the overall economy by far the costliest to Alaska families and takes the most money out of the Alaska private sector. They didn't come up with these you know out of thin air. They did analysis. That's what the conclusions are. That's what the economic analysis shows, and and. And, and for the for the Alaska government to be going down the track of that being their first lever to pull, and indeed the only lever they're going to pull, uh, is just uh, is it, just unimaginable. I mean, who, what legislature goes out and does takes the worst possible step that has the largest adverse impact on their economy in the middle of a recession? What legislature does that? What governor does that? Right. Yet. That's the Alaska. That's the Alaska governor and the Alaska legislature that are doing that. And the reason is, once you go through the analysis of the income, the reason is, is they're just not they're not on the same wavelength. They just don't understand what those impacts are. And, I, and that, with that, I would agree. Again, the disconnectedness between the remote of the, of the location, geographic disconnectedness, and obviously, for the most of them, this disconnectedness via income, they just do not comprehend what we're talking about. I mean, I'm in the I'm barely in the middle uh, or the upper middle income class. Uh, and probably if you averaged it for the fact that I have six fam- six family members, I'd probably fall below that. But it is a huge – I mean, we're talking about it was uh, almost an 8% cut for my family's income last year. Now, I mean, you know, we made it. We're fine. We, we can do it. But it, what about those families that it pushes them just below, down into the next – you know, now they're not – upper middle now they're middle or they're not middle now they're lower middle i mean what what happens how many people got pushed into poverty because that mere one thousand dollars that mere starbucks a day for some of these families was the difference between heat or eat you know uh and 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 now that money was supposed to go pay for government uh but it didn't of course it just sat in the account so now what do we do yeah exactly and 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 so 
And, and so the, I mean, your $6,600 is $6,600 to you, but you spend that, right? You spend that in the local, you spend some of that, probably a, a significant amount in the local economy that generates in that generates more income. The ICER analysis is for every dollar that's distributed in a PFD, it generates $1.4, dollars $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. $1.40 uh, in income in the, in the Alaska economy. It has the most bang for the buck uh, of, of any of, 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 of the fiscal options that the that the legislature's considering, so we're taking money not only out of your pocket, but we're taking it out of the pocket of those who would who would benefit from from your expenditures uh, of those in the local economy. I, it, it, it just it astounds me. I mean, the, the the looking at this at this income chart and looking at um, uh, <laughs> the lack of impact. Of the PFD on these legislators, um, and and you know, sort of the insensitivity that creates is just just astounding to me. Well, and and I think Susan in the chat room brings up an interesting point. We're talking, by the way, with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget about the details of the PFD cuts and what the effect is and why we might have a disconnect on this. Susan says it would be interesting to know average middle income wages of Alaskans from the '70s moving forward in today's dollars, then a comparison of those numbers to our government employees, including legislators and senators for the same time frame, and use these numbers to show the disparity using the cuts in the PFD versus a flat tax. Uh, I think she what, what it did is it sparked an idea in me, and we start looking at the the average uh, state of Alaska employee is well beyond, uh, you know, the the average middle income, you know, fifty thousand dollars plus with benefits and wages and salaries and everything else. I mean, that's where the protectionism seems to be falling when it's all said and done. Yeah. So yes. So you've got it. You've got a, a you got a, a class of, of workers, state employees, who are a trying to protect their jobs. So they want uh, government to have more money because that will that will that will help maintain their jobs, and they want government to raise that money in the least burdensome fashion possible to them. Um, uh, and so if they are in the upper middle and 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 higher income uh, classes. Uh, they're going to, you know, the, the least burdensome to them is to raise it through PFD cuts because taxes would, uh, even a flat tax would have would have a, a larger impact on them. Yeah, we've got we we so so those are the people that are advising and and reporting to the governor and talking to the legislators and in the in the Juno uh, ecosystem and and that's sort of the the climate we've created there. Meantime, middle-income Alaskans, and this is 20% of the Alaska population, right? Each of these breakdowns, top 20%, upper middle, middle, lower middle, and lower, are each 20% of the population. Right. In the meantime, we got 20% of the Alaska population that are just being, uh, well, more than 20%. We got 80% of the Alaska population that are gonna that are gonna uh, uh, suffer more economically as a result of PFD cuts. Uh, than uh, than as a result of flat taxes, but we've got the we got the top twenty percent and the upper part of the upper middle uh, uh, sort of making the decisions about how everybody else lives. This and again, this is frustrating because you're the one that's doing the analysis of this. Um, and I was reminded of this when I picked up an article from the uh, this morning from the uh, 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 ADN. It was a link from Alaska Journal of Commerce talking about the constitutionality of oil tax credits, which we'll get into here in a minute. But again. Uh, Elmwood Bremer, who I think is normally does a pretty good job, never mentions the fact that statutorily we're paying exactly what we're supposed to be paying uh, at, at some of these deeper connections. Uh, no, nobody's doing this deeper analysis. It just seems to be the external thumbnail. Here's what the press release said. That's it. I mean, I could read the press release for myself. I don't need them to reword it and send it to me. What I need is some investigative journalism that digs deeper into the details of it like this. Yeah, part of the problem with Alaska also, and, and, and one of the things that, frankly, we've tried to fill with Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets or are trying to fill with Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is we don't have the same sort of think tanks, the same sort of budget hawks um, uh, in Alaska uh, that, that exist in D.C. I mean, you go to D.C. and you've got the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, you've got uh, the Concord Coalition, you've got uh, the Peter Peterson Foundation, you've got people who are looking at budget issues and who do this sort of analysis on, a, on an ongoing basis. And, and so they're issuing press releases and 
some of that's being picked up and some of that's leading to questions. We haven't had that in Alaska. In fact, we've sort of got the reverse. The people that you would think might do that, the Chamber of Commerce, well, that's mostly top 20 per, that's mostly top 20 percent right. uh, and, and, and oil company driven. So you've, what you've got in Alaska is our groups that, that you would think would be looking at these issues aren't. Uh, they're sort of going along with the, yeah, let's cut the PFD because it doesn't hurt us very much um, uh, mentality. And, and so you're not getting this sort of uh, this, this other source of analysis uh, out, of, out of think tanks. So frankly, that's, that's another reason that, that, that I dug into this. I, I had, I'd, I've, I've been spending time working on federal issues with the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, um, and they have, they have this sort of analysis of some of the economic uh, uh, issues that are that are going through Congress, so you know, I said, well, geez, if I can't find that in in the in the media, right? That you normally, find in DC, I'll just I'll just create it myself. Um, hopefully, you, you know, I, we've got to start thinking about these issues. These guys, again, I'm not accusing them of legislating out of their own personal interest, but but these guys are 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 just not sensitive. To these guys and gals are just not sensitive uh, to the impact of the policies they're making. If they were, uh, they wouldn't be making these sorts. I, I hope they wouldn't be making these sorts of decisions. Yeah, and I would agree with that. And and uh, again, thank you so much for digging deeper to this because it was really when I saw this uh, the the, uh, the other day when you posted it. Uh, I was in Fairbanks. I was up there working uh, at the shows and stuff and doing some things. And I'm on my phone and people are trying to talk to me and I'm scrolling through this. My eyes are just getting wider and wider. And I'm like, holy cow, no wonder there's no empathy on this. No wonder, because it's just it's it's just astonishing. I've posted the link in the chat room right now on Facebook. So if folks want to take a look at the article, uh, it's linked up there uh, and you could take a look at Medium and, and read it for yourself and see these numbers, which are just astonishing the numbers are astonishing um but i did just mention the oil uh, credit programs and the bond for oil credits uh elwood bremer did have a piece on this uh talking about uh, calling into question the constitutionality of it uh apparently willikowski has gotten an opinion from ledge legal uh but you've got some takes on this with the oil tax credits that go beyond the legality of it and talking about how this actually makes the problem for alaska worse down the road. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So, so the way that the way that uh, the oil credit issue has been analyzed, uh, the oil tax bonds have been analyzed to this date, is the argument from the administration, Department of Revenue, and those in the legislature that are supporting it that say, look, um, this is a the, the oil tax bonds would would actually would push the costs out to future periods. We would go borrow a bunch of money, the state would go borrow a bunch of money, pay it off to producers, and then pay back uh, those bonds over an extended period, sort of like putting it on a credit card, uh, if you will, uh, and then paying it back over time as opposed to uh, as opposed to paying it out in accordance with the statute. Well, if you analyze what that's doing, um, uh, it, it's, it's pushing these costs out to future periods. The, the current it, the current cost of those bonds will be relatively low. Instead right. of 180 million this year, we'll only have to pay 25 million dollar on the bond. 25 million dollars on the bonds. That's the that's the estimate that DOR has given. So DOR says this is a good thing because it's going to push those costs out in the future, and we're going to have revenue from all these oil projects uh, uh, out there in the future, and we will be able then to, to we'll have more revenue to pay for these bonds. Um, and so they argue it's a it's a it's a great thing to do. The problem is they're looking at these oil tax bonds in isolation, and they're looking at the effect in isolation. We've got it, when you when you look at the ten year forecast for Alaska, and you look beyond that, we've got a huge fiscal iceberg uh, that's coming up on us uh, in in the not too distant future, and that is. Payments due for PERS and TERS, due for the state retirement systems. The way we've adopted, the, the, the approach we've adopted to how we're funding uh, uh, retirement um, in this state is, is sort of a, a, a sliding scale going upward over time, starting out in a relatively low level of payments and then increasing those payments over time, increasing those contributions into, the, uh, in, into a fund that funds invested earning returns on it 
uh, and is and is supposed to produce enough money then over time to be able to pay out all the retirement obligations. But it, it increases over time. We've pushed off, we've kicked the can down the road uh, on those obligations. And and the assumptions, I mean, th- there are huge assumptions about, or huge numbers coming up on us uh, for payments due uh, under PERS and TERS. Uh, one analysis that ICER has recently done, or been done in conjunction with ICER, says that uh, uh, from 21 to 25, uh, 20% of the revenues that we're projecting are going to have to go, 20% of the un, uh, unrestricted general fund, the UGF revenues that the state are, is going to have, are going to have to go toward PERS and TERS. So we got these huge numbers uh, that are coming at us. Jeez. And frankly, Michael, th- those are understated because right. because the, the assumption of the returns we're going to get off in the, in the retirement account is that we're going to earn 8% per year. We haven't earned that for a lot of years. And and when people in other states talk about similar funds, they're talking about six percent returns. They're not talking about eight percent returns. To the extent we shortfall in those returns, to the extent the fund doesn't earn eight percent and only earns six percent, that means we're going to have to contribute more. So the numbers that we see coming at us, these expenditure numbers that we see coming at us uh, in future years, are going to grow uh, if we don't have those eight percent returns. So. We've got this huge fiscal iceberg coming up here, and 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 then when you go back and look at oil tax credits, we're pushing these oil tax credits right into the same period uh, that the PERS TERS numbers uh, start escalating. So when you look at when you look at the oil tax credits in isolation, you go, eh, okay, maybe maybe we're going to have increased revenues, maybe we can better handle these costs. Uh, uh, down the road. But when you look at them across the board, what our costs are otherwise going to be across the board when we get out to those periods, and you take into account the PERS TERS costs that are coming at us out in those periods, we can't afford them. We can't afford them in the future periods. Right, We're, right. That, the, the, the space that we, that we may have as a result of increased oil revenues, it, if we get those, the space we may have is already, be take, or is already being taken up by PERS and TERS. So this is the, the all credits is I mean, it's, it's a classic political move, right? Kick the can down the road, move those costs out, you know, beyond my term in government. Let me get through, you know, from a Walker standpoint, let me get through my two terms as governor, and then it'll be somebody else's problem to deal with. Push these down, make me look better, give me more room for K through 12 spending, give me more room for university spending uh, in the meantime, push them down the road. Um, and, and I can understand why a politician wants to do that. But from the standpoint of somebody who's concerned about the future fiscal condition of this state, I just can't understand why why that's a good thing, particularly when you see the PERS and TERS costs out there. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest from Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad, one more time, just for emphasis, how much is a percentage of our budget will we be spending on PERS and TERS obligations uh, in uh, 2026? The, est- the estimate in, in a recent paper uh, uh, co- co-authored by ICER and available on the ICER website says 19 to 20%. Of the entire Actually, budget? Uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of UGF, uh, of, UG- of revenue. Unrestricted general fund spending, right. So just, just, just putting that out again, 20, one-fifth of our unrestricted spending – would go straight to PERS and TERS. And so, again, to analogize this to anything else, this is like I've got a house mortgage. I don't have to pay anything much for maybe 10 years, but I got this huge balloon payment out there, and now I've decided to do the same thing and buy a bunch of hot cars and do the same thing. I'll only pay 100 bucks a month on these cars, but the payment's going to come due about the same time as my balloon payment when i got to pay off the vast majority of it. That really makes sense. That sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. And that's what these guys are doing right now now any thoughts on the constitutionality of this i mean again uh uh, uh, alaska ledge legal is basically saying this really falls outside the purview of what's constitutionally allowed as far as bonding although jada lindemuth has already came in came uh, came forward and said oh no don't worry about it we can do this anytime we want uh any thoughts on that have you had any deeper analysis as a former counsel and legal mind can you tell us uh, your thoughts on that I think there's an open question on that. The Alaska Constitution says uh, that the state cannot bond without approval of the voters, um, and and that's the that's the provision uh, that the Ledge Legal Council is relying on. Now, what the administration is saying is, well, we're really really not bonding without the approval of the voters. These are really these bonds are 
uh, uh, subject to appropriation, that that means that we don't have to appropriate the money uh, if we don't if we if we choose not to, and so it's just really a promise to pay these these or 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 a good faith intention to pay. Right. Uh, these aren't really bonds in the in the constitutional sense. The, the Supreme Court's looked at this issue in the past and and has has approved under some conditions this sort of this sort of promise to pay approach, this sort of conditional approach, and said that's not covered by the Constitution. But but here, you know, the rhetoric around this is uh, we are going to pay these, right? We, these are these are obligations of the state. Uh, this is you, you know we're, we're we're taking this money, we're paying it off to producers because we say we owe the producers, uh, and and we're going to pay these these lending institutions uh, back for this money. Um, and so the 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 optics of what we're doing here, or the or the environment of what we're doing here, uh, seems to indicate a fairly firm intention to pay, a fairly firm obligation on the part of the state. So it's I, I think I think the legal question is is up in the air. Um, but that's but as as we were discussing, that's not what's driving me here. I'm, right. I'm not going to I'm not. It, I'm not going to get into a debate. If, 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 if it was good financially for the state to be doing this, I'd be advocating for doing this. And yes, we got to address the legal issue. But if it's good financially for the state, we ought to be doing it. This is bad for the for the for, right. for the for the state's fiscal situation. And it's not going to show up today. It's not going to show up tomorrow. But for people who are going to be here, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years from now, um, uh, it's. <laughs> We're gonna. They're gonna be scratching their heads, going, "What the hell were you guys doing? I mean, you just decided that we were the dumping ground, right? You were gonna just dump all these costs on us. You're gonna dump pers and ters on us. You're gonna dump uh, uh, these oil gas uh, 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 tax credit bonds on us, and and we're leaving very, very, very little space uh, uh, in that time frame for dealing with anything. I mean, we're we're setting up an absolute a situation where. Where K through 12 cuts, K through 12 uh, spending is going to have to be cut significantly. University spending is going to have to be cut significantly. Or in order to avoid that, we're going to have to wipe out the PFD and we're going to have to impose taxes on top of it. That's the that's the degree of of of, of problem we're setting up in the future uh, with these oil, oil and gas tax credit bonds. So, I I. <laughs> I can understand. I can understand the motivation of the oil industry, right? They want their money now. They don't really care about what's going to come down the road on Alaska. I can sort of understand the the, the motivation of the politicians now, right? We want to kick these costs down the road. We want to look good. We want to instead of having to spend 180 million dollars as the statute requires, we only want to spend 25 million dollars this year. We'll look better. Yeah, you know, we're 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 doing good. We're cutting costs. Uh, and we can say that, yeah, we've you know we've got some way to cover these costs going forward. But I can't stand, I can't, I can't understand why anybody who's concerned about Alaska's overall fiscal situation thinks this is anywhere approaching a good idea. We're just we're just kicking the, these costs down into a time frame that's just going to make the overall situation much worse. Well, and, and I think we're into a double danger category here for for a couple reasons. One, you're going to have people who are going to say, well, now we're not spending 180, we're only going to spend 25. So that remaining 155, 160 million dollars, we now have that freed up to do something else with, or, I mean, potentially. Uh, this is the same thing that got us in this situation, quite honestly, with PERS and TERS. Well, we don't necessarily need to fully fund that because we got some other things we really want to pay for, and we have discretion, so we're going to do it, and so we'll pay it next year. And then the next year it became next year, and then the next year it became the following year, and nobody ever paid it, and all of a sudden we're billions of dollars behind the eight ball on unfunded liability and other things. And again, it is the hashtag kick the can down the road itis that we can continue to see out of this legislature, whether it's deferred maintenance or paying into contributions and obligations or paying the, the paying the tax credits or whatever it is, they always want it to be somebody else's problem. But eventually the music will stop and there will not be enough chairs for everyone to sit down. And then who's going to be out in the cold? Well, more than likely it will be the taxpayers because we will be on the hook for it. And like you said, my biggest fear is that some judge in some court says, well, you got a $60 billion problem permanent fund, you can pay it out of that. Uh, you'll have to break your constitution and do it. I mean, it's just, it is astonishing, but that is where we've come to this point. You know what, what, what really triggered, what really triggered this, this latest, this latest reaction from me, certainly Michael was a tweet 
that the Alaska House Republicans put out. Now, this is the crew that has been in charge up until the last two years ago, right? The House, the, the House was a, was majority Republican. This is the crew that sort of got us in this situation, right? By 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 overspending, overcommitting, you know, building astroturf football fields on every at every high school in Anchorage, you know, building two engineering buildings, just just spending in all sorts of ways. That, that was just wrong and, and, and put us in this situation. Two years ago, you know, the, the, they, they became the Alaska Republican minority or the House minority, the Republican minority, and they said, we got it. We're going to be fiscally prudent. We're going to be fiscally responsible. We're going to look at this stuff and we're going to, you know, and we're going to, we're going to help bring these costs down. We're going to, you know, do all these amendments to, to budget bills when they come through to reduce costs. And yeah, we know the Democrats will reject us, but we understand now. We are the fiscal conservatives. Right. We're the budget hawks. Right. We're going to bring spending down. And then we get something like this, House Bill 331, and they tweet, and they're all in on it. Let's do right. this. Right. Let's, you know, the last the last thing of the tweet was, let's get it done. You guys are nuts. Right. You're the guys who said – you the guy. You're the guys who said you got it. Now you're going to understand this stuff. You're not going to do this again. And yet, right now, right now, with this bill, you're leading us right back into it. I just, yeah, you know, I. <laughs> they they find they find they find religion, and then all of a sudden they're apostates again, all over the place. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Like, oh, hallelujah, yes, we're on board. Oh, wait, is there a shiny? Oh, I can spend money on that. Let's do that. I mean, it is crazy, but. Uh, it is. I there's it, it's I, I mean, I can understand it out of one or two House Republican legislators. I mean, they're they're the, the big capital budget guys or the big oil guys or, you know, somebody who you know who, who always wants to be investing government money in something else. I can understand it. But the but the formal organization, the House Republican uh, minority tweeting that, you know, three thirty one's a great thing. Let's get it done. I they just lost credibility. I mean, whatever credibility they tried to gain back by saying, we got it now, we understand, we're not going to do this again. They just lost it with that tweet. Well, and when it comes back to the fact is it just plays right back into the stereotype that the Republicans are literally in the pocket of the industry at that point, because that's what it appears. The industry throws a tantrum. They're crying. They're receiving what they were statutorily obligated to receive, but it wasn't enough. And they, again, you know, uh, saying, holding up the moose cartoon and saying, we were promised, we were promised. And it looks from the outside, it plays right back into the stereotype that the oil industry has got the Republican legislature in their pocket. And and that is disappointing to say the least. It is. And it and it and, and, and you know they tried to one of them tried to tried to tell me, well, we're being fiscally responsible because we're bringing costs down in this fiscal year from $180 million that we'd otherwise have to pay <laughs> under the statute to $25 million. And I just looked at that person, I said, just stop. Don't just- even Try that. If you haven't done the 10 year, 15 year analysis on this and figured out that we're spending more uh, uh, by bonding uh, than we are by just playing out the statute, paying according to the statute, if you haven't done that and you're going to try this trick of, well, this year it's better, uh, just, you know, you're not, it's not worth talking to you because you're just not, you're not thinking as a fiscal analyst, you're thinking as, as a politician. You didn't learn. Well, that's from, from the run up from 2010 to 20, 2016. You didn't learn. That's exactly what got us in this position right now is these people could not think beyond next year or next election season. They never thought of a 10 year average. They never thought of building two engineering buildings and the maintenance costs. They never thought of the deferred maintenance that has to be done on all this infrastructure or these pet projects or anything else. They never considered the 5, 10, 20 year forecast, the unintended consequences of of what they were doing and yet now they look us in the eye and say trust us we found religion we know what it's going to take yeah well they don't they don't <laughs> i don't know who I, I don't know who does but they don't that much that much i've got now that tweet proved to me they didn't get it uh and and so gotta, gotta go look for somebody else who does get it <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, and again, what bugs me is that nobody is talking about the fact, and, and this is this is kind of where I want to, and I know you want to talk about oil prices. We're running long already this morning, but I, I want to point out something really quick. I had somebody come to me this weekend while I was in Fairbanks and talk to me about our discussion on the flat tax and say, we've got to stop talking about the flat tax because we, you know we, we've, we've played into their hand. We've done this. We, we're not going to give up on cuts. And I told them, I said, you have to understand, they have moved moved the battlefield from a question of revenues versus spending to a question of which revenue is the best. We don't control the battlefield at this point. They're controlling the conversation on that. And so if we're going to be poisoned, we need to pick the, the the least worst poison for us. I don't know how to move it back to the discussion of a spending problem versus a revenue problem. All I know is that we can bring that into every discussion, but we've got to do it. They've done the same thing with the oil tax credits. They've done exactly the same thing. We've stopped. Nobody's talking about the fact that we are paying what the law prescribes. We are paying the mandatory minimums. Now it seems to be like a foregone conclusion that we have to pay them all this money that we owe them now, no matter what. They've moved the argument from, hey, this is statutorily what they're supposed to get to, how do we get all the money to pay them right now? And I don't know how to move it back to, because people like Nat Herz and Elwood Bremer, nobody, nobody is saying... Hey, statutorily, they're getting paid what they were supposed to get paid. They're getting what they were promised, and nobody's bringing that up. Well, more important than that, Michael, I mean, yes, the the press should be doing that. But more important than that, the Alaska Senate Republicans, right, the Alaska Senate Republicans, uh, since since 2012, and, and, and no doubt before, but since 2012, when when I've really when we've really been focused on this, have said we're fiscal conservatives. We're not going to spend a dime more than we need to. We believe that the Senate when the when the Senate Republicans came back into control in 2012, when they when they beat the the bipartisan Senate majority that had that had preceded them, they took control. They listed three priorities, the one of which was to go to sustainable budgets. We're going to get spending under control. We're going to we're going to be the ones that do this. And 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 they've been the ones that are now leading the charge in SB 26, leading the charge to cut the PFD because they can't cut spending anymore. I mean, that, that when you look at the budget this year, the Senate is spending more than the House. The Senate budget spends more than the House. The conference committee will probably come out with more than both of them. Right. But the Senate budget, the Senate budget spends more than the House. So, I'm sure James is listening, and I'm sure James is the is was, was the one bending your ear in Fairbanks. But the guys that we elected to do this aren't doing it. So, when when, when nobody's standing up to say to to actually cut the budget, when all they're doing is talking about it, but when push comes to shove, they don't cut it. You got to face reality after a while. This has been, you know, this since 2012. This has been six years. It's been three legislatures that they haven't done it. Right. So, you know, wh- wh- when do you, when do you finally say, you know, yeah, I'm going to keep talking about cutting the budget, but by the way, they're cutting the PFD in the meantime, um, and the PFD is the absolute worst thing you can do. Um, if you talk about the budget, they say, yeah, 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 we're going to cut the budget someday. But by the way, in the meantime, we're going to cut the PFD. You've got to start talking in realistic terms about what's going on and talk about alternatives to the PFD cut because they sure aren't aren't talking about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brad Keithley is our guest with Alaska's for a sustainable budget. Brad, you and I have talked about it for the last uh, two years that, you know, what we're dealing with is a cyclic nature on our resource, uh, you know, on a resource driven economy that, uh, you know, I was using the analogy earlier of, of this pirates running from one side of the ship to the right. other, rocking the boat. Uh, that's where we've been at. That's what this legis- all these legislators have been doing for years, spending like madmen in crisis mode when they don't have enough money, back and forth and back and forth. Uh, now we're seeing oil prices bump back up. You and I talked about it, uh, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, oil getting back up to $80 a barrel potentially, and here we are today, $75 a barrel for uh, for Brentwood, and, and uh, you know, these crude oil prices are popping back up. Um, what does it mean for Alaska and you know what what you know what does that spell for our revenue in the future? How should we be looking at this? It it could mean it could mean very good things, Michael. Uh, the oil industry there's there's two when you look at when you look at oil there's three big factors going on. One is Venezuela production is dropping like a rock. Venezuela historically has been one of the big producers, um, uh, not as big as the not as big as Saudi. 
uh, but certainly a major producer. Because of the economic chaos in Venezuela, their production is dropping like a rock. Uh, and that's really, you know, it, uh, President Trump attributes it to OPEC's policies. It's really not. Right. It's really just Venezuela just just dropping dropping through the dropping through the earth in terms of its production. Um, the second big factor is demand growth. Uh, we have had uh, a demand response. We had a we, we in the 2014 2016 timeframe. One of the big problems you know, on the demand side was a reduction in Chinese uh, uh, economic activity, uh, and as a result, a, a, a reduction in in demand. Chinese demand, um, and that really contributed a lot to the to the oil, the softness in the oil price during that period. Chinese demand, Chinese economic activity is lifted back up. That's brought demand back up, uh, and with with the reduction in in immediate oil as a consequence of Venezuela, uh, uh, that's sort of soaked up the excess in the market and has started to drive price up as demands continue to go up. And the third factor in the market is lack of investment uh, in conventional supplies that's occurred since 2014. We've had, we've had a, 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 a huge drop in the amount of investment uh, in conventional supplies and, and in non-conventional supplies in shale. But we've had a huge drop in particular in conventional supplies. We sort of rode the curve, uh, projects on plateau, uh, fields on plateau for a period, but you know, ultimately, they sort of run out of oil and start dropping off. And if you haven't invested in developing new fields, as these old fields start dropping off in production, um, you don't have anything to replace it. And so you've got supply going down as a result of that. And the lack of investment, the low in investment we've had since 2014 in, in, in developing new fields, major new fields, uh, is now showing up in, in supply softness. Uh, and that's driving these prices also. Those, those factors. Um, should be uh, should continue for for a while. I, there's no sign that Venezuela is going to come out of its out of its uh, out of out of the economic condition it's in. Um, even if it does, it's going to take a long time to get that oil production back on. They're losing the capacity to to, to bring that oil production. Um, uh, demand uh, looks like it's continuing. Uh, globally, uh, the IMF is saying good things about the global economy. Concerns about about the spots here and there, frankly, a concern about the U.S. because of our debt levels, but but concerns about spots here and there. But generally, generally speaking, the IMF saying good things about the overall economy, which which drives demand. Um, and it's going to take a while to get the investment levels back up to get these these old fields off. So it looks like this price uh, environment ought to continue. If we had gotten spending down <laughs> in this state, down to long term sustainable levels, we'd be actually looking pretty good. But but the problem is we we've, we've we've sort of gotten stuck in the effort uh, of of getting government spending down. So this oil price recovery, though it helps, uh, doesn't solve the problem. The analysis that Ledge Finance did at the beginning of the session said we had to get to ninety two dollars a barrel average price twenty nineteen uh, uh, in order to have in order to have uh, be able to pay for a four point six billion dollar budget. Uh, and uh, pay out the traditional uh, 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 dividends, $92. Well, we're not going to get to $92. So right. if we drop spending down, down below $4 billion, or down to $4 billion or below, we'd be in a lot better shape. That $92 would be in the 80s someplace, and we would be beginning to look like we're going like to get through this. But because we haven't brought spending down, we're still a long way from, uh, uh, even with recovery in oil price, we're still a long way from getting back in balance. Which leads us to our final thought on this. That all being said, we just, I mean, we just, we just gave everybody a PhD crash course on what's going on in the, in the state legislature and budgets and everything else. What do we do now, Brad? I mean, again, the minority who was the majority found religion, but we've still got the other side on the on the on the Senate side that have always been doing the same thing: bigger budgets, more spending. Nobody willing to take the hard choice and take the profile and courage and actually cut and tell people we can't afford it. And so here's where we sit: What do we do? Well, we've either got to elect different people because this this group has shown. They've shown what they're going to do. I mean, the House Republicans now who claim they'd found religion all of a sudden have lost it again. They've shown – this group has shown what they're going to do. We know what we're getting. If we reelect this this group or large segments of this group, we're going to continue getting the same thing. And we need to be talking about 
alternative revenue measures. We need to be talking about flat taxes instead of PFD cuts, instead of the thing that does the, the has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy is by far the costliest to Alaska families and takes the most money out of uh, the overall uh, or the, out of the Alaska private sector. We need to be talking about alternative revenue measures. Either we elect some, either we elect a new group, and it takes it's going to take more than just a new governor. It's going to take some significant changes in the Senate, some significant changes in the House. Either we elect a new group, or we're talking about alternative revenue measures. It's just you, there's just no other way around it. I mean, we can't. The oil prices are, are recovering, but they're not going to recover to $92 a barrel. They're not going to recover to the level necessary to to bring it back into balance. If this, if we aren't going to find people who are going to cut, uh, then uh, we're going to be talking about alternative revenue measures. And 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 I'm and I'm not confident we're going to find people who are going to cut. So that's why I'm talking about alternative revenue measures. How do, uh, Harold asks, how do your ideas, how do Brad's ideas, how do these things that we're talking about, how do they get heard in the legislature? Because it appears that they're just ignoring everything that we're talking about. It appears that all the, you know, the reporting on it is kind of ignoring this. Um, I mean, how do these things get heard? You elect new people. <laughs> that's it. I mean, I've, I've, talked, I've talked to legislators sometimes so I'm blue in the face, and that's probably... You know, I probably why I don't get invited down to testify anymore. I, they, they've made their choices. They've made their choices that they want to cut the PFD. They want to take the economic convenient thing. They, they want to take the economic choice that for them is better. They've made the choice that they that they they want to spend. Uh, that they that they don't want to cut. That they've hit the limits of of cutting. They've made the they've made the economic decision that they want to talk about things like like uh, you know bonding for all tax credits. Right. Um, it, it, you need new people. We know what we're going to get out of this crowd. We know what we're getting out of this crowd. We need new people, or we need to be talking about, as I said, we need to be talking about alternative revenue measures. Yep. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And what we've got here is a real problem. Billions of dollars in the hole with nobody willing to take the hard uh, the hard stance and say you are – uh, you're not going to get all the freebie stuff that you want because we just can't afford it anymore. Brad Keithley is with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. You could find him on Facebook. I posted up his article today on the uh, on the issues of who really uh, seems to benefit the most from the PFD, and uh, he talks about the legislators and more. You could find all this information on his Medium site and on Facebook. Best place to go is Facebook for that. Brad, as always, my friend. This has been eye-opening and fulfilling, and I hope that people out there will listen to this and take it to the polls because that's the only – we've got to change the players if we expect the game to change at all at this point. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming in and joining us again. Brad Keithley right here on the Michael Duke Show. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on our Facebook and Twitter feeds. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week. 